thank you all for being here. And we're sorry we're running a little bit late. We'll try and make up for that. I'm Barbara Jones with the Harlem Swing Dance Society. And we are promoting, preserving, and protecting this culture here in Harlem. We won't get into that tonight, but you can all, always ask me questions during the event. We're going to have a panel discussion. I'm going to introduce the panel and we'll get started. But first, I'd like for you to hear from Jazzmobile, one of our partners with this event. They had a unique relationship with Norma Miller. So I'd like for Ms. Robin Bell Stevens, the director of Jazzmobile, to say the words. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see so many of you here today. And I feel like I've seen you guys for, what, two, three days in a row now. It's been wonderful. We, some of us went on the Turners not too long ago, and then, of course, earlier today we went at that wonderful celebration of the life of the phenomenal, phenomenal Norman Miller at, uh, at the church, and then some of us went to the internment afterwards. And, you know, when uh, Allison asked me to say a few words, I'm like, okay, so I know the audience, right? So each and every one of you has a story to tell about Norma. And all of you probably know more about her because I can't dance. So, but that said, I had the good fortune of meeting the quite fabulous Miss Norma Miller through Phoebe Jacobs. Again, a name that a lot of us have heard a lot of the past couple of days. Um, in addition to being the director of Jazz Mobile, the other hat I wear is that of vice president of the Louis Armstrong Educational Foundation. And it was through Phoebe, of course, as I said, that I met Norma, mm, gosh, over 20 some odd years ago. And I, I'm trying to think, what can I say that you don't already know? And the only thing I can think about is when I first met her, because y'all weren't there then. Um, and, uh, and that was how she made me feel, right? Because we've all heard it said, it's not always what they say that you remember, but you always remember how they make you feel. And I heard these stories about how she could be a little tough, and that she could, uh, she could go toe to toe with the sailor if necessary in a conversation. Um, but with me, she was always, almost like sort of nurturing for some kind of reason. I don't really know why. But when I told her, you know, about what I did, and obviously involved in jazz music, I had been producing the Jackie Robinson Jazz Concert for many years. They went to Jazz Lincoln Center, then a jazz mobile. And it seemed like she had a story about somebody in every place that I work. I had a story about somebody that I had presented at a festival. And in terms of how it made me feel, it made me feel connected to her even though I couldn't dance, because she just, she found a way to make me feel comfortable with her. And then when I uh, got involved with the Louis Armstrong Educational Foundation, and we started the Satchmo Award, and the Satchmo Award has historically been given to a musician, but most of the uh, recipients have been musicians, but it's not necessarily just for the musicianship, but for the contribution to the culture of the music. And it's always, you know, everyone on the committee always has who they like to honor, but when Norma's name came up, we said, this is the fastest meeting we've ever had. Because not only does she deserve it for what she did professionally, but most importantly for me, because I think she said it herself, that being in the music is what she does, it's who she is, it's not her job. So who she, so we honored her, not for her job, but for who she is, my music is intentionally. Also in terms of the education and the youth, and making sure that this wonderful, wonderful legacy of the music and dancing continues throughout. So um, I think she said it also when she was writing uh, music, talking about Louis Armstrong, she mentioned that Louis Armstrong said, whatever you write, you write music. You want to write music, there's going to be people on the dance floor. So I know that's what you all do, and I know you'll be doing that tonight for the rest of the time you're here. So, you know, like everyone else, I thank you, Norman Miller, for all that you did, for all that you've done, and we will all keep swinging. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. And one more person, the director of this wonderful museum, Ms. Lauren Kelly. She has a special announcement. Thank you, Barbara. This is one amazing politician right here because she said, I want you to stand in front of everybody. Uh, and first of all, welcome to the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling. We're so happy to have you here and very honored to celebrate this very special uh, uh, woman's life and legacy and passion. 
Uh, this incredible project here, uh, if this is the first time you've come, we hope this isn't your last. We're very happy to have you here, but it was built on passion. And I'm so excited to be able to celebrate the legacy of someone who, up until her last breath, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, lived incredibly passionately, so I look forward to this, this journey of celebrating her life. And then, you know, uh, she said, I want you to tell everybody that this book is going to be in the museum uh, very soon. And I, I wouldn't have said yes if I didn't agree, but she's got a very great way of like of getting her agenda uh, achieved. <laughs> so we're very excited to, uh, to make sure that the legacy of Norma Miller is passed on through future generations of children uh, to keep the passion alive. Thank you very much and have a good night. So now we're going to get to this panel and read through as much as we can. And throughout this panel, um, we're going to hear Norma's name, but the original title was Harlem's Living Hop Heritage, From the Savoy to Small's Paradise and Beyond to you guys. So um, can we have the My Movie 2 video played silently? Oh, and incidentally, there won't be a Q&A session, but you could ask these wonderful panelists questions afterwards. And we're going to introduce them. First, the gentleman with the hat, Mr. Sonny Allen. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Darlene Gist, and she'll tell you a little bit. <laughs> Next to Darlene, we have Maxine Simmons. Next to Maxine is Ms. Crystal Johnson. And on the end there is Ms. Barbara Phillips. So briefly, we're going to first start with the Savoy Ball. And everyone can look that up, Wikipedia, Google, and see the history. But what I want to ask Sonny Allen is the importance and relevance of the Civil War. Hello, Chip. No, really, the relevance of the Civil I went to the Civil War in the 1950s. And uh, I learned how to do Lindy out there. Lindy up there. <coughs> But I learned also that the Savoy was one of its kind. At that time, there was no other ballroom around. They had mixed crowds. <coughs> when you had um, the Savoy, you never saw a person get tired of dancing there. The Savoy was the only ballroom that had springs underneath the dance floor. So it gave. You never saw a woman take her shoes off at the Savoy. You know. Also, the Savoy was the first ballroom to have continuous dancing. When the band played their last note, the next band played their first note. And if you couldn't do that, Charles Buchanan will give you the door. That's the way it was. And from then on, now you have continuous music. But the first time it happened was at the Savoy Ball. You know, with that was Mo Gale and Charles Buchanan were the big people there at the Savoy. You know. Um, when <coughs> a friend of mine told me something a long time ago, although he wasn't a Lindy album, but he came from Cuba by the name of Mario Valdez. Mario came here and worked with Chick Webber. Well, you hear Savoy at tune. The guy was playing the solo with Mario Bowser. You won't hear of him, but you'll hear of his brother-in-law, Machida. And he's the one that brought Dizzy Gillespie with Chick Webber. You know, and he told me one thing, he said, in order to know where you're going, you got to know where you came from. What's wrong with us now is that we don't teach our kids where we came from. It would be good if we do that now. And I hope things will change. Okay? Thank you. 
Now, Barbara Phillips, when did you go to the Savoy? <coughs> I went to Savoy, I think it was around about 19, like 51, something like in, in, in that order. I went there, be a minister with you. I was told if you go there, you find a lot of young men there. <laughs> so I went there to look for a husband. <laughs> but for my surprise, I'm still single. <laughs> Even all my people that was dancing. And during that time, I knew a little about dance, but not that much. So for me to go there to the Savoy, I learned quite a bit. I learned quite a bit of different dance. It wasn't only Linda, they had all types of dancing. Every week there was something different. I learned a lot of people. I made a lot of friends. And from that day to this one, I still have friends that is still alive. And we'll still go back. And one girl that shook us up, I met her there. And she and I have been friends ever since. Great, great. OK, well, one thing um, we know Norma as one of the, um, not pioneers, one of the innovators of that second group. Um, our video was not playing uh, the My Movie 2. If you can get that role in, that'd be great because there's going to be images of Norma and other people will be speaking. So to continue, um, one thing that Norma mentions, even in her children's book, is about the Harvest Moon Ball and why that was important. It started out as a tragedy. Um, it started as a tragedy indirectly, and um, who. Uh, a robbery on 125th Street. And according to Norma's book, after that robbery, of course, it's on the news, it's in the in the YouTube videos about the first riot in Harlem in 1935. Because of that riot, it brought the spirit down in the community and in all of the city. After that, Mo Gale and the Daily News got together at the Savoy Ballroom and they talked about a dance contest being done in the city and it would have different dance genres. It would have polka, it would have tango, it would have rumba. But the highlight was Harlem's dance of the Lindy Hop. So that is where these panelists come in. Uh, Norma was in the first Harvest Moon Ball, and this was in 1935. But also, these panelists here were in the Harvest Moon Ball. So can you each tell me which Harvest Moon Ball you were in? Starting with Sunny? Yeah. In the mic. <laughs> I won the Harvest Moon Ball in 1958. That's the same year as the Ward Ball closed. Um, well, by the time it got to me, that was 1979 that it fell forward. And I didn't believe it. But I had it all. This was my first Harvest Moon. And, and I pleaded with Waco Harvest to answer because I didn't have Were you, were you also in the Mama Lou Parks Harvest Moon Ball? Yes, those two as well. Okay. okay. And Maxine? Well, I was fortunate enough to dance at the old Madison Square Garden, and I believe it was 1960, I would say 65. Yeah, I came in third place. Very good. <laughs> So that was my first, and I did it two years in a row. So 65 and 66 came in third place both times. Came in first, third place both times. Yeah, the, the old Madison Square Garden. I can see it vividly, even to this day. It was an awesome experience. Okay, and Crystal? Oh, hi. I won in 1972 at the Harvest Moon Ball, the old Harvest Moon Ball. Um, and one of the highlights of that Harvest Moon Ball for me was Bob Hope, was the MC. Now who gets to meet Bob Hope all the time? I thought that was absolutely fabulous. And then I had to, 
dance a tile in first place, and I killed it. <laughs> not by my part. I mean, me and my part has done this way. <laughs> not by myself. It was absolutely beautiful. And the old guard man, whoever played, I can't remember the band that played, but they played that jumping at the woodside like it was basic. Yes. It was off the chain, and we was moving a hundred miles an hour, two, two minutes non-stop. Y'all don't do that now. <laughs> you can't do the two minutes, but we did two minutes non-stop, air steps, everything. Wow. It wasn't no, uh, uh, and take a rest. It was straight through. It was straight through. And then I had to dance a tile. Okay, so imagine, I was out of breath. Okay. But again, I won first place, and that was an honor. We have a demonstration behind you of Sugar and George from 1955, yeah. the champions. Now, Crystal's being modest because Crystal is a second generation Harvest Moon Ball champion. Tell them who your father is, Crystal. My father was Tops. And when did your father win? Daddy won in 1940. Him and Will the And he could dance. He danced with Whitey also. They all danced together with Norman and they could, they all, that whole group, we thought we danced fast. They was our mentors, okay? That speed on them, can't nobody touch that speed, okay? And when you can do it like that, you a champion. You are a true champion. So, yeah, 1940 was Daddy's championship at the Garden. Great. And Barbara, when did you win? Okay. You know. <laughs> in 1958, I entered to the Hollis Nome Ball by accident. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to enter, but we had this fella at the school named Willie Posey. And Willie Posey had wanted to enter the Hollis Nome Ball, and nobody wanted to dance with Willie Posey. He was a good dancer, but a little wild in a way. So, Sugar Husband and Big Nick came to me and said, we have a problem. I said, huh? That we have a problem. We want you to dance in the Hollis Moon Bar. I said, not me. They said, yes, you can do it. We have checked around all the girls that were scared. We could do it. You could do it. I said, no. They gave me three weeks. And I entered with Willie Posey, along with Sonny Allen, and I think it was George Davis. And by my surprise, I came out winning third place. Right. And after that, I turned, I started dancing professional. And once you dance professional, you cannot enter again. And those rules change later on though. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, um, as we're talking and looking at the videos, um, there were three generations with the Savoy Ball. Those were the pioneers, such as Shorty George. Then came the innovators, such as Norma, Frankie, Tops, Almonds, and others. And then the generation that Sonny and Barbara speak of are really like the trailblazers. The keepers of the flame would be Crystal, Darlene, and Maxine. And they're just a few of many. But what I want to ask Barbara is, where did you dance when the Savoy Bowl was closed? Wherever well, there was music, we went downtown. We went, um, that was a small paradise, what? Small paradise, kind of club, plenty of places that was there. Okay. The Renaissance and all, we was there. Sonny, do you have any? Sonny can't remember things I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Chester, I just saw something. I was looking at this guy here. A lot of people might not remember him, but his name is Sir Charles Hughes. He was a singer, dancer, and a guitar player. I used to play drums with him. And he also was part of Norman Miller's jazz messenger, Charles. And he also was a Latin dancer. There he's doing that. Well, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
Okay. Right. Now you said about um Where did ball dance when the Savoy closed? When the Savoy closed, everybody started going to a place on 125th Street. That was 120 West 125th Street called Central Ball. Before that it was called the Little Latin American Club. And Joe Cephas is the guy that owned it. He also wound up owning uh, Frank's. That was on 125th Street. And he had Dick Searchy's band was the first band to play there. And that happened on a Thursday night. And we used to call it Kitchen Mechanics Night. And that's where it started. We left from there and went to Small Paradise. Small Paradise, actually what happened is that they went up there and wanted to have something for the senior citizens. Oh, wait, 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 that's a little bit later. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> the, okay, but we're going to move on. <laughs> okay, all right. Because we want to jump to another Savoy, the Savoy band, the Keepers of the Flame. And I'd like for Darlene to start off talking about that, or would you th do you think Crystal should start off? Because Crystal was before you. Yeah, let's let Crystal start off. Talk about the Savoy Manor. Oh boy, Savoy Manor. I started at the Savoy Manor. Oh, this is where, this is how it really started. I mean, this is the deal. I used to go to the Apollo every Saturday, and I used to watch the Barquettes, Mama New Park's dances, front row seat, and I always said, I'm, there, I'm, I'm getting up there. I'm doing that. I love the Lindy Hop, but I didn't know where to go. So the gentleman that I married had said one day, come with me to my friend's house. I just got to stop by and talk to him, not knowing that when he knocked on the door and he walked in and I walked in the house, guess where I was? In Mama New Park's house. So I, you know what I did? I walked into my dream. Because when I walked in that house and my husband said she wants to dance, and here I am. So keep your dreams alive because you never know when it'll jump up on you. You never ever know. And I was 15 then and I'm 70 now. And I, it's just that. And it's a boy manner. We had so much fun. We would practice every day. We practiced from Monday to Friday for the Harvest Moon Ball. George Sullivan, Sugar's husband, was our teacher. Mama Newt was our teacher. But Sullivan is the one that cleaned everything up and the air steps and everything would have to be tight. Now I started dancing in 65, 60, 64, 63, 63. It took me seven years to master that harvest moon ball. So it was no joke. So those of you who are dancing now, check out the Pioneers that came before you. I'm serious. Because everybody wants to be a wannabe. Okay? And everybody wants to be a master. It takes years to be a master. You don't wake up one day and be a master. Not to the Lindy Hop. Not to that. Okay? I'm just letting, putting it out there. I'm keeping it real. <laughs> some, some of y'all are looking at me like, hmm. What she talk about. I know what I'm talking about. Okay? You got to be a master at it. You just can't say I'm gonna be in the championship and be in the championship and think you all that. Because you're not all that. But I was told I wasn't all that. Okay? And I, I love criticism. Okay, if you see me doing a wrong step, let me know. Okay? That's how I learned. And so the Savoy Manor, we had a ball. We had a ball, and it was like, and then the parkettes was there. We was always dancing. We just danced. Like, dance. We just danced, like, throw each other in the air. Like, okay. Well, the highlights, the highlights of it was we, the younger crew, would be there. We would be rehearsing for the Harvest Moon Ball, and in would come the parkettes. Yes. Vicky and Gigi and Debbie, and we were really. We were starstruck. And you know Debbie Youngblood, Lottie Youngblood's wife is one of our captains that we yes. danced with for years. 
So Debra Youngblood is an official Barquette. Okay, okay. Um, the next point I want to get to is that lady, Mama Lou Parks. What can you all say about her? I know Norma mentioned her in this book, Swinging at the Savoy, and she was very happy that she was preserving and keeping the tradition going. So what can you say about Mama Lou Parks as a preservationist? Darlene, maybe. Oh, well, I love Lou. I love Mama Lou Parks because she was real. She was down the she, was, she, was, she was all that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, can I go back a little bit, kind of connect with Crystal, what she said? I was in a showcase at the Cotton Club, the Honey Gold was giving me my little tap routine. And it was like two people in the club, nobody was there. And uh, it's like a Tuesday night showcase. So we're just milling around and there's this one-legged man there with crutches. And I'm wondering, wow, I wonder what he's gonna do. He's gonna sing. And we, we started talking to each other and we made friends. And he gave me his number. He said, just give me a call sometime. This is my manager's number. His manager happened to be Mama Lou. So I'm talking, and his name was Alfred Farley. And uh, so I called Mama Lou, and she's like, you know, I told her a little bit about what I did. I didn't know anything about her Lindy hopping or none of that. But she said, send her my picture, whatever, whatever. And I did. And then she invited me to Smalls. So it was Smalls that I first met her in all the dancers. Savoy Manor came later. And I walked into Smalls, I think it was a Sunday night. And it was a rehearsal earlier that day and a show for that evening. I walked in there and my mouth flew open. Everybody was flying. They were, I said, yeah, this is the place for me. And I just, just somebody showed me how to do the stops and you know, and you don't learn it right then and there, but I got into it. So I said, yeah, I'm coming to this show tonight. And when I came to that show, this woman here, Crystal, that blew my mind. She danced like she had the Holy Ghost. And I said, oh, and then when she threw her partner, I said, oh yeah. That was my induction into the Mama Lou group at that time. And after that, then I began to go Savoy Manor. Like they said, it was big fun. Everybody teaching each other. Other Savoy dancers coming there, Ronnie Hayes, Lee Moses. You know, teaching everybody, and just, it was just fun, fun to count Basie, to count means to do. Oh my God, that album, I still play it, you know, <laughs> and it was great. just, it was just electric, it was a lot, it was the place to be on whatever night rehearsals were, it was like two or three times a week, and it was rehearsal wherever you were, on the way home, on the back of the train, yeah. in somebody's community room. Just so caught up in it, you just didn't. You wanted to rehearse all the time, you know. So anyway, that's my story, of Mama Lou. I loved her, and she she was just a giving, wonderful, fun woman. Everybody was her baby, you know. It was just fun. She made it. She made it fun to come to rehearse and to be a part of that whole world. Great. Yeah. Now, son, we can get back to smalls on Monday nights. Savoy, <laughs> no, Smallhorns. Well, after you had, uh, as I said, Central Ball, we started going to Small Paradise. Our, uh, Al Cobb's band was the first band that played at the uh, Small Paradise. At that time, Chamberlain had bought it with Chamberlain and Jim McDougal. And what happened is that they decided to go up there and they got a grant from the city where the, the senior citizens could come there and dance. And Al Cobb's band, I think it was 18 pieces or 16 piece band, used to play in the back. And that's where it started when the Lindy Hops used to come to the Small Paradise. They changed the name from Small Paradise to Big Wilkes Small Paradise. And they had to do that because they couldn't 
change the name. They wanted to change the name Small Paradise. But because of the contract and everything else, they couldn't do it. So all they did was put Big Will, Small Paradise, in front of them. And that started the Civil War. I mean, it's small. From there, they went down to the Cat Club. And you could find somebody else. Well, why did Smalls close? Do you know Barbara? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard different things. Well, there's a lot of reasons, really, that I'm hearing myself. But I think Sonny can verify this. Smalls was so popular at one time that we had a lot of the white people come up to visit Smalls. During that time, it was hard to get a cab to go home from there. So an organization that named the Masons, they had owned Smalls Paradise. But what they did, they rented a taxi, a taxi cab company. But that taxi cab company was only to pick up the white people and take them down downtown when they left Smalls. Well, the black got a little angry. So a lot of them stopped coming. Am I right, son? A lot of them a lot of them stopped coming. So instead they would go downstairs, downtown rather. So once the people then all of a sudden the black people went on back downtown to fall in the you know, fall the back because they like the way they dance. Then finally small that they didn't they didn't have the crowd that they had before. So the Masonic organization, they had to sell the building. So that's what happened to Smalls. And then maybe Sonny can tell you a little more about it. Uh, what really happened a lot of times, in those days at Smalls, I think Margaret started coming to Smalls. And a few other people, they came to Smalls, saw people dancing, told their friends downtown. Hey, Dick, man, you got to come up to Harlem, man, and see these dancers. And Marvin and them came up there and learned the lending. Now, like everything else, all the newness wears off at times. When they first learned it, it was a big thing. But when they had to wait for a cab to go all the way back downtown, they used to get pissed. Now, People that lived in Harlem, like me, I would take a girl to small, get ready to leave, walk outside, see a cab, and say, get, no, I'm sorry, this is for those other people. So you only can do that for so often. So now, when, especially when the white people stopped coming to small, they went downtown. Now, they're downtown. Now they think they'll get the blacks to go to small now. But since you've mistreated us before, we wouldn't come there no more. So that's what killed small parents, basically. You know, and then of course, also, keep back too, I won't even get into that. That was a divorce of a different color. You know, okay. Okay, I'll leave it at that. All right, well, we have an empty seat here. Um, can the person who's supposed to take this seat come up? And they're going to tell us a little something about why there was a detour. His name is Mr. Alan Roper. If you don't mind, I'm going to talk from over here, okay? okay. So, and I'm not going to use the microphone. I think you can all hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Can you all hear me? No. Can you hear me? Okay. So, in the 1960s and 70s, they were keeping it alive, but the flame started to flicker a little bit. But by the 1980s, around 1985, a group of people, I'm sorry, a group of people got together and decided that they really wanted to have a place that could put together the Lindy Hop. And so, that group became the New York Swing Dance Society. And the rebirth of swing dancing, Lindy Hop, in that era, 
starting in the mid 80s, going all the way through. And I got to tell you, I just have to say it. I'm not going to go through all the names, but there's particularly one person who kept going like the Ever Ready Bunny and kept it going as long as possible, and kept going and going and going until very recently. There's Margaret Badger right over here, who was one of the founders of the New York Swim Dance Society. Stand up, Margaret. Stand up, Margaret. And I think a lot of you are... I want a picture. I think a lot of you have been to the dances that she was a part of and produced with the New York Swing Dance Society, and really kept it going. Um, I've been also mentioning another name or two of people who were constantly coming to everything, and I'll get to the, what developed afterwards, and then tie it in to how Frankie and Norma, particularly, who had been there to start it all, restarted it again with us. But we had Charlie Mead over here, who came to everything that was ever done and was one of our stars, and Sonny, of course, came to everything. And eventually, after that, organization and the dancers really caught on at the Cat Club, which became an institution, a legend. Around 1989, there was another person, happened to be named Gabby Winkle, who lobbied the Swing Society heavily and said, isn't it time that here in the New York area, when they're doing it all over the country, where Lindy Hop started, we have a dance weekend and we all go away somewhere and start something. And I was part of that. And we put together, some of you have heard of it, it was called Boogie Dance Weekends. And that started, and eventually over a few years, that ended up being three or four weekends. And by 1993, the American Swing Dance Championships came along. It was the second largest event in the United States of swing dance. So the rebirth, really, of the New York Swing Society and all of that, all of those weekends, really made the dance come alive between 1985, forward, all through the 90s. Now, at about 1998, the Lindy Hop part of the American Swing Dance, which covered all the different kinds of swing dancing, was so, you know, uh, packed with people, it was so popular, that it was time to create an event that was just dedicated to Lindy Hop. So we have Paul F. Rockington over here, who kept it going for 22 years now, the American Lindy Hop Championships, and brought that forward. So now I want to tie it in and go back in history, back to the future. This could not have happened, in my opinion, as the person who produced some of these events, without Frankie and Norma. I remember the first year we were going to do a competition. There was a little bit of debate and controversy. Do we really want to do a competition? And then Frankie Manning came along and when his sister heard to speak, he said, well, that's how we all got better, by competing. And that was that. And the next thing you know, we had a major event in New York City. Norma, now, those of you who were there this, this morning heard all, a little bit of humor, so you'll get this. Norma was my enforcer. If somebody decided they weren't going to show up, or were hesitating, or Frankie hadn't yet committed because he might go on vacation, she said, no, you're not. <laughs> and make sure he was at the weekends, and Norma was at every single event and helped really to make sure that it was accepted because by them being there, the continuance of the Lindy Hop really went forward. Without, without Frankie having been at the first weekend, without Frankie having not been at the championships, I think the kind of crowd that came and the way it developed and the things that went through there, um, it would have been much, much more difficult if at all possible. So that's my little story in terms of what happened to bring it back to now. Okay, so you were very close with Norma. 32 years. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Well, what we just did was do little snippets. We didn't get too deep into things, but you got an idea, tip of the iceberg of some of the history here in New York. But we are celebrating and honoring her legacy. We're gonna get into that a little bit more. Um, can you say a couple of words about Norma? A couple more words? We're going to go down the table. I won't use her words. <laughs> um, well, Norma really wanted to see the, the events and the dance, the Lindy Hop, continue and even grow. Not just be preserved for a small group of people, but keep moving forward. And she did all kinds of things, but the things that I was familiar with were the events that I was involved in. 
and Norma really pushed very hard to make sure that people participate. I remember the first time I saw her do the uh, routine of uh, the beat and getting up there and then pulling people out of the audience and getting that whole thing going to it don't mean the thing if you ain't got that swing. And that really livened things up. Um, she was just more out there than some of the other old timers. She was really, like they say, the queen. And I think without those people, without Norma, it would have been much more difficult. There were times when I was almost like giving up on some of the events. It was becoming too difficult. I was wondering, are people going to show up? But Norma kept pushing. She made sure. She was the enforcer. People showed up. Great, thank you. Sonny. Uh, let me see. I can't say a lot about Norma Miller. I met Norma years ago, but when I went to Harvard's Moonwalk, I formed my own group called the Rockettes. And we stayed out on the road mostly all the time when Norma was around. And so we didn't keep in contact with Norma all the time. We replaced her on some shows. She had a jazz lesson when I had the Rockettes downtown in the village. Norma, if you got to know Norma, you'll find out that Norma had two sides of her. She had a nice side and she could be a I'll leave it alone. <laughs> you understand? But the trouble is, the thing that she couldn't stand you telling me is, how do you count this? She didn't believe in counting. And you'll find out that mostly no dancers believe in counting. By the time you count, the music is going south. You know, and this is what these kids have to learn. But other than that, but no one mother was, like I said, there's the old saying, if you don't have anything good to say about a person, don't say nothing at all. <laughs> Both ways. I love her and I hate her to her at the same time. <laughs> it's the truth. And I'm, you know, I have, some experiences with Norma that I will never get my money. <laughs> okay, that's the money. So, I'll pass the money. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, like I say, I, I spent the last 36 years knowing Norma Miller. But one thing I want to point out is, aside from the dancing and all that, she really was, um, in a way, not even in a way, she really did took, took my skills or made me take my skills to a whole nother level. You know, unbeknownst to me that was happening until she would call up and say, she find out you could type two words in a paragraph, she got you working on something. I got in her first, very first book, which was just a dream, an idea. She had the first three chapters and I want you to, to Fix this, fix this up for me, I need a book. Like she needed it like tomorrow. And she had all these pictures and you know, it just so happened that life had put me in a position where that's the kind of work that I did and I had access to printers, I had access to uh, people to help out. I was a typesetter, so I put the three chapters together and I just put to be continued. But I don't want to exaggerate so much on that book, but that was the very first one which she wanted to show to a publisher to get her real book done, which came out to be uh, some, something in Savoy, I think. I just had a friend of mine print it up, spiral bound it, and she was ecstatic. You know, oh, I got the book, I got the book, and she forgot about me being a dancer at that point. <laughs> I was her production girl. And, and that was just the first time, and it just grew. Years later was something else. So we get up to 2009 and I got out there, swing, baby, swing. I my book, she would talk about these things like they were already done. And she, I mean, normally would just call you Monday and she needs a book by Friday. You know, whatever I, I got it done, 
she was typing, she had her laptop and would call me and, you know, that, how, do I, how do I say this damn thing and I like this? <laughs> so she took you through the ringer, but she got the job done, you know. And it was just very hard, I must say, to <laughs> my editor, she to my proofread, like, she goes by the rules of everything. You know? Too many prepositions in the noun before this. Get all done. <laughs> this is comma. Just look for misspelled words and grammar. But anyway, that's the one thing I want to say. She propelled me. I mean, I did what I did to make a living. But next thing, she's introducing me as a publisher, as a writer. <laughs> People are looking at me like, "What's going on?" to say next. So I wore a lot of hats with her. She's ours. 
She's ours. Y'all got upset. <laughs> she was ours first. Okay? And it was just a, a, a fantastic thing. I was so honored to meet her. And I'm just glad that I, I, I did. It, it was just added to my list. Great. And finally, Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> I met my. Uh, I met Norman quite a few years ago, and I have did many shows with her. Uh, not too much I can tell you that you don't already know, but someone has already said. I can only say one time, I can't remember now, I think it's one of the shows at the follow I'm not for sure where it was, but it was a while back. And we had just finished our act and came off the show, and she was standing in it, in a way. So I said, would you excuse me, please? She said, no. <laughs> I said, would you excuse me? And I said, that's Sonny back there. He's mean. He won't go up to the dressing room. She said, I just want to look at, look at the girl that they told me to do a half step better than that. I said, well, there she is. She said, uh-uh, that's you. She said, but I have something to tell you. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep being man of people. Do everything that I've seen you do tonight, and you won't go wrong. And nobody, she was right. I took her up on that, and I've been doing it ever since. Thank you, Thank you all. She left, she left no stone unturned. She did it all. Dancing, singing, writing, oh, yeah. all Everything but opera. But Norma left no stone unturned. She did it. What a complete life. What a complete life. Yes. Doing you. Yes. Really doing you. Yes. Like everybody said. Do you? She did it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, we do have a video to show before we transition into the next um, next discussion. Uh, Bobby, is it ready? Oh, <laughs> this is a work in progress, but it documents Norma's years in the Harvest Moon Ball. So for those of you who have never seen the footage, uh, give it a moment. champions, but no one was there. Jitterbox, this is heaven itself. 
you don't weaken. <laughs> Now we get to see not only Norma, but we get to see Crystal's dad do his thing. Thank you. 